Welcome back to another fun episode of Call to the Table, where... Wow. I messed that up real bad. (laughs) No, you didn't. It's another fun episode of Call to the Table. We are a goofy group of podcasters who just love talking about Jesus and all the things that he encompasses, that being our big round earth. I'm Liv, and I am currently in a state of crazy, crazy delirium. I'm John, and I want to poke Olivia with a stick. (laughs) As long as it's six feet, John. As long as it's six feet. (laughs) I'll do it with a ten-foot pole. I'm not the Grinch, hush. (laughs) 49 and a half foot pole. Oh, gosh. I'm Jordan, and I have a headache because I have been in meetings from 9 till 3 o'clock this afternoon, so... I'm Caroline, and I hate math because I've been tutoring (laughs) a student, and I, I, I was BSing, functioning, notation, whatever. We were basically guessing at the whole thing, and between the two of us, we got to work on her, her math stuff for school. It, it was, hate it, absolutely hate it. I can only stand about two hours at a time. My goodness. You math people out there who, like, it's your life, you you are so, so left-brained. Like, it, it's <laughs> incredible. It's absolutely incredible that that can sustain you and give you life while it's just like a vampire for me. Okay, my rant is over. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. You're allowed to have your rants. Meanwhile, you English people, how can you always be right when there's always an exception to the rule? Oh, go John. But a real English major will say <laughs> that there is always an exception to the rule, That's so true. we're not, not always right. So, so in math, it's always one plus one equals two. Unless you're in base two, then one plus one equals ten. Would you shush? Stop! Stop saying math. That you're going to give me a worse headache. <laughs> okay. So today, I like math, people. You do I like, like math. math. You don't. You don't like history. People live. No, I <laughs> like math. I like science. I like art. I don't like history. I don't like English, and I don't like foreign languages because they're hard. Because yeah, if I can't really speak have, like, English, one over live. Art. <laughs> oh, you know, I like art stuff. That's actually been with the kiddos that we've been talking about. That's been the generalized thing: is they want less reading and writing and more science. It's fun. You get to blow stuff up. (laughs) So today we are talking about something that I think a lot of people will think that we've already talked about, but I'm going to kind of clarify as we do this. So we're actually talking about maintaining positive mental health. And this is almost like a part two to the one that we did in February. We talked about mental illness. So y'all, I want to bring it to you. What is the difference between just general mental health and a mental illness or condition? <clears throat> well, <laughs> according to the uh, Canadian Mental Health Association, Ooh. BC Division, when and I'm quoting their article because I looked it up because I wanted to make sure that I gave an educational standpoint because I do I do love talking about this. And, and again, like part one of this, I aspire to be a therapist and a psychologist. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, to talk more about this. But it says, and I quote, when we talk about mental health, we're talking about our mental well-being, our emotions, our thoughts and feelings, our ability to solve problems and overcome difficulties, our social connections, and our understanding of the world around us. The next little paragraph says, a mental illness is an illness that affects the way people think, feel, behave, or interact with others. There are different there are many different mental illnesses and they have different symptoms that impact people's lives in different ways. And quite honestly, that's how I would personally probably sum that up myself is mental health is just the the overall well-being of our mental state, whereas mental illness has an effect on our overall self. Yeah, I agree with that. What about you, John? I mean, I was simply going to say everybody needs to worry about their mental health. Only people that suffer from a mental illness need to worry about their mental illness. 
So what's the difference between the two? I mean, other than everybody has how their mind works daily compared to there you go. somebody who has, I don't want to say issue, but. <laughs> <laughs> who has an illness. Who has an illness that hinders. Better, there's illness. a better word for it, and I'll, I'll tell y'all about it when we get to my turn. So. <laughs> I'd say for me, going off of what Liv said and elaborating a little bit more on what John said. No! <laughs> I think just, I look at it as like a physical thing. So you have to upkeep your physical health on a day-to-day basis. That means eating correctly, although we don't always do that. Getting exercise, stuff like that, because because it prevents you from getting physically ill. It's the same thing for mental health and mental illness, there are things that you need to do to upkeep your mental health and how you're able to process stuff during the day, which is what Liv said, so that it's not something that turns into a habit, which is something that can turn into an illness. So yeah, that's what I would say. Caroline? Okay, so fancy term that I learned on the internet, that being there are neurotypicals and neurodivergents. And I know a lot of times uh, people who are on the autism spectrum or uh, people who have other uh, types of, I mean, I'm just going to say neurodivergency, uh, use that to identify their condition as not as much an illness, but sort of it just sort of where they are in life, even if they do take medications and that sort of thing. And so I think what we're talking about is there are people who they already have that neurodivergency in their brain, and it's a condition that they have to deal with all the time, which I know is what John was talking about. But then we have people on the neurotypical spectrum who are uh, dealing with something that is sort of a I don't want to just say it's a temporary upset because I mean I know that's what this quarantine is but still uh I don't want it to sound so tiny, you know, insipid whatever, but you know, they're they're learning to cope with something that's slightly bigger than usual and so they might find themselves uh heading down paths that uh they, you know, didn't know about or I guess my point is It's basically going off of what John was saying, but at the same time, we have the neurodivergents who are people who have something that is, they are divergent, ergo, they do have different things that they have to deal with on a daily basis. This is a lifelong thing uh, versus people who are neurotypical, and everyone is going to deal with it in different ways. But at the same time, for people who are neurotypical, you can feel anxiety you can feel depression they are still valid even if you are not a uh, neurodivergent and uh there are ways to take care of it which might be an easier fix for people who are neurotypical versus people who are neurodivergent and might meet, need more uh drastic efforts and so uh whether or not you fall into either of those camps your uh suffering is real and uh, it should not be belittled or compared to other people because, I mean, you know, if your foot is bleeding and somebody's foot is cut off, you're both in pain. I mean, yeah, there might be a difference, but, like, your pain is still valid. Your foot's so, cut off, your, you know, your pain is not valid. what I'm trying to say. There's a lot that we can unpack here. What? I said if your foot... Whose pain is not valid? I said if your foot's cut off, your pain is not valid. Yeah, I saw uh, there are really good comics online uh, where somebody was showing uh, if people treated physical illness the way they did mental illness, like, you know, people in casts and they're like, how can you say that you're really in pain? You know, and people in a wheelchair, what are you saying you can't stand up? You just have to think your way through it, you know? So it's like, it it's the same thing. It's just, you know, invisible. And that's what makes it so stigmatized and so hard. But this is a time where people are experiencing uh, different things that they haven't had to experience before in this prolonged period. And so people react differently and, you know, it's, you don't want it to develop into like a lifelong thing. Uh, But, you know, take heart. Everybody else is dealing with this as well in different ways. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I feel like I did a weird intro 12 minutes in. But uh, you just you just taught our our listeners some very large words. Good job. Two two words. Neurodivergent, neurotypical. So <laughs> thank you Tumblr. <laughs> there you go. So what are some signs to look for um that your mental health is not where it should be? Uh you feel bad? <laughs> We're going to start with live. And I'm just saying the obvious. Go ahead, Liv. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the most obvious signs is your like your your normal routine is altered in any way, shape, or form. So one of the most obvious signs for me that my that my mental health may need some attention is my sleep pattern changes drastically. So for me personally, I am a night owl. I don't usually go to bed until two, three o'clock in the morning and I'll sleep. I mean, it's just how I roll, you know, (laughs) but then I'll sleep until my normal time to wake up is usually nine, nine thirty because um, I work an evening job. You know, I, I have a different schedule than most people working as a dance teacher. It's an after school activity. So I don't have to be up early in the morning. My, my emails can wait until I actually get up and I can move through them, you know, with my morning coffee and I don't have to be in an office or I don't have to be at school or I don't have to be, you know, at a restaurant or I don't have to be, you know, at a mechanic shop, who knows, you know, wherever you work, I don't know what you do. You don't have to see people. (laughs) I, I don't, I don't have to see people until later in the afternoon. So one of my biggest signs is if I'm up later and sleep longer, uh, that's one of the most obvious signs for me personally. And that also is an obvious sign for a lot of people is you're, you're probably experiencing a little bit more insomnia. Maybe you're not sleeping as much. Maybe you are staying up later, but still waking up at the same time. Um, another sign for me personally that I recognize is my eating habits change. I eat less when I am in a mental, in a mental state of negativity. Um, I, I see myself as a physically active person and when I'm not physically active and my mental health is taking its toll, it's not that I don't eat. It's my eating habits and my eating patterns change to the point where, you know, I'm not a breakfast person unless it's early in the morning and I know I'm not going to be eating till lunch um, or I'm with people. Usually I'll just have my two cups of coffee and wait till lunch because again, I'm up at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock you know, somewhere roughly around there. So it's like, I can wait a couple more hours to eat lunch, but. Or unless Chick-fil-A is involved. Exactly. Unless Chick-fil-A is involved, then I'm there. (laughs) But if I notice that I put my lunch off a little bit longer, just because I am filling my time, filling my mental space with different things, or my dinner is sooner than normal because working an evening job, I don't eat dinner till like nine, 10 o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Those are some of the the first things that I notice for my mental health. Um, but as an overall statement, I think a lot of people see their, their moods change, their attitudes change, the way they interact with people change. There's, I mean, there's a laundry list that we could go through, but I want to give somebody else a chance. You sure about that? I mean, do you want me to keep going, John? <laughs> I mean, y'all play nice, but not playing we nice ha- is so we much have fun. Been. We oh, have been nice. playing nice. Him and I have been talking frequently. We've been playing nice. I yes, I know. I'm. Yes, I know. All right, John. Yeah, I don't really know what to say to this. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I can talk off of me. For me personally, it's I just get irritated more often. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I don't necessarily understand things the same. Yeah, I would agree with that. But that's not always easy to point out. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think I'm going to go ahead and take mine because John's being oh so talkative. I think when Liv, like you said, for you, it's, you know, your, your sleep patterns or what you're eating and stuff like that. I think... And a lot of people will not like hearing this, but I think technology definitely plays a part in this. I think um, when 
for me, when I'm on my phone or I'm vegging out on movies or whatever more, and I'm not getting up and, and being active, it definitely makes a difference in how I feel at the end of the day than I did at the you know beginning of the day. The other part of it, too, is when I don't feel... When I feel like there is something, and we'll, and we'll kind of touch on this later, but when I feel like there is something in particular that I'm really, really, really dreading, that's not, that particular thing is not, and it's not like going to work, you know, because I love my job. We just all don't like getting up early. Liv especially doesn't. Preach. But, <laughs> I, don't, up early. I don't want to hear not wanting to get up early, Liv. I don't have to. My job doesn't require me to, so I don't have to like it. I wake up about an hour after you go to sleep. You know what? So does my fiance. It's <laughs> fine. But I think I think when there is something that typically should be bringing you joy, like spending time with a particular person or going and doing a particular thing and all of a sudden you're dreading it and that's not normal, then that's that's kind of a sign that you need to take a look at your mental health and kind of keep that in in your head that that may be something you need to start kind of actively doing. Caroline. Oh, Caroline. <laughs> I uh, 100% agree um, that uh, you, the more in tune you are with your body, the better. And I don't mean that you need to be like ridiculously introspective, but definitely aware of uh if your patterns change, are they for the good or are they uh, not? Um, how, how are they making you feel uh, after you maybe spend, uh, like, are you going to say, oh, I spent too long doing that, but then you keep doing that and then you notice that you're feeling bad. Like, you don't want to find yourself in habits that are going to uh, keep you in a bad place for a long time. You know, you don't want something that could be temporary to stay with you. And, I mean, going off of my own, well, I mean, I do consider myself neurodivergent because my serotonin levels are stupid. It's like my body just, my body is dumb. What can I say? Uh, my genes are dumb. <laughs> Your genes are not dumb. Your yeah, body it, is not dumb. You, it, yes. I Look, I, I. it's nice to... It's nice to be able to blame part of it on, you know, my, it, it's just the way my brain was wired. And some people's brains were just wired differently and or, you know, just anyway. Yeah, so, but that doesn't uh, mean but, it's dumb. That just means you're wired differently. It, it's dumb when it makes me feel bad is what I mean. Okay. And uh, I can, I mean, for me, I know... I'm not where I should be if I am having physical symptoms of anxiety, which uh, tends to be the full spectrum of, uh, well, not, not straight up panic attacks, but, you know, since that was what kind of got me started on this, not where I would prefer to be in life at the current moment, but I've lived this way for many years, uh, you know, headaches, um, not sleeping very well um uh the oh so wonderful symptom called uh, a sense of impending doom yeah that one really stinks um but i i know something is wrong if it's like yeah i i shouldn't be afraid to drive i i shouldn't feel afraid to leave the house like you th these are things that like jordan said if it's preventing you from doing something that you actually want to do yeah there there you you need to address that uh because you should feel free to go out and do things um and otherwise you know because your your brain can play tricks on your 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 brain can hold you back and uh nobody wants that not you not anybody else so uh i feel like that was a really roundabout way to say Fine. what i wanted to say yes Liv. I hope it made um i just wanted to insert another like way that people could potentially I mean, I guess this kind of goes into our later topic, but one of the things I recognize is my Enneagram number yeah. shifts. And that's another... Can I talk about what that is? Yeah, I can totally talk about what that is. Hold on. I have I have a whole thing of notes on just the Enneagram um, that I made for some friends that I can actually 
kind of share really quick. I don't have, I won't go through the whole thing. I'll just go through like my personal. We keep um, saying we're going to do an episode on this. My personal. We really need to do an episode on this. We really should. You know, it's something that I feel like this is something we should just do for fun when we're hanging out together. And so that way we can really learn about it and have fun with it. Because the more fun we have with it, the better it will be when we talk about it. Yeah. And I, I think with the Enneagram, it, because it's so it's so in, in depth, it would definitely need to be something that I think we should, like Caroline said, have fun with before we come on, because there is so much about the Enneagram that gets overlooked sometimes that's deeper than just the test. You know what I mean? Um, but like for me, one of the things that I recognize in in myself is if I'm not my truest self um, as far as the Enneagram goes, which the Enneagram is, I have it pulled up, hold on. Um, Basically, the Enneagram is a quote unquote loosely personality test. Not so much that it, it helps you dictate like what personality type you are, but it's really how you handle stressors and situations in oh, in total. Um, yeah, so it's not so much like I'm an extrovert, that's my personality type, or whatever that one with all the letters that I just absolutely can't stand because there's so that one. There's just too much for that. It's just too much. Uh, it, um, it is super long, but I was forced to um do it uh as part of a class for college so uh <laughs> that's that's the reason i know mine so well gotcha um this one this one's a little bit different because that one does kind of give you the synopsis on like what your personality type is where this one kind of feeds off of how does your personality type handle situations and handle external stressors or even internal stressor, stress stressors can't speak Holy stressors Lord. Um, so if we look at the Enneagram in that sense, um, and we just take, you know, a real quick synopsis of it based off of my Enneagram number, I'm a six, which is the head part of the Enneagram. And it's more of the, it's the loyalist, the guardian, the engaging and responsible one, the one that kind of takes the front end of any situation and will, uh, protect everyone else. So they usually have plan A, plan B, plan C, and plan Z all planned out and ready to go. They know, you know, they've gone through every case scenario, whether it be good or bad, ready at the forefront of their mind. So they're mentally prepared. And this is in their their healthy, re- like regular state. Um, so, you know, they're, they're typically extroverts. Mm, no doubt. They are typically, you know, from from my research, they're typically the ones that kind of can make friends no matter where they're at and become immediate, like, I'm going to do everything I can to um, to show my loyal loyalty to you, which I feel like I kind of, you know, I resonate with that a little bit um, being a little bit. I, I, I feel like we as friends, we've had this conversation and it's like. <laughs> She's kind of saying verbatim something we were talking about the other day. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But uh, every Enneagram number has a regressive and a progressive uh, way of handling situations. And most places you'll see it's considered a relaxed or unhealthy situation. So if an Enneagram 6 is met with a situation that is extremely relaxed. There's something that they're very comfortable in. It's not something that's like super, super, super stressful. Um, you're, you'll see them kind of graduate or gravitate towards a, a nine, which is more receptive and agreeable, uh, kind of go with the flow, you know, oh, I'll do whatever anyone else wants to do. I'm totally down for whatever um, type of personality because it's not something that they feel like they have to protect everyone around so they can really let their guard down and be like, I'm happy with whatever makes everybody else happy. But in an unhealthy state, so, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, is that why you and John gravitate toward each other and hit each other all the time? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to put it out there. <laughs> I, I, I won't. I won't argue against it. I need to know his enneagram number to really understand. I would um, need to know my enneagram number too. So, 
Yeah. But then you also have the unhealthy states. That's the stressors. That's the part that creates that mental unhealthiness and and the things that really get that person worked up. And for a six, they usually tend to gravitate towards a three, which if a six is gravitating unhealthily towards a three, they have a relentless work schedule and are constantly anxious because an unhealthy um, Enneagram three tends to be the achiever and the successor, meaning they will do everything in their power to make sure that they are pleasing and protecting everyone around them. Um, Being that, you know, they're extremely anxious all the time. They will think of every worst case scenario. They will, they will worry themselves to death to make sure that everyone around them is protected no matter what situation comes to bat, come to be. So it, take it in the sense of COVID-19. When that started, my immediate reaction was, how can I make sure my students, my friends, my family feel safe? What is the best thing I can do? Because typically I would make this kind of situation an unhealthy situation in my brain, leading me down an unhealthy mental state. Um, Because I would worry. I'd stay up all night thinking, okay, how how can I make this money last? How can I make sure my family feels safe with if I have to do X, Y, and Z, if I have to go to work, if I have to go here? How can I best support my fiance who is now working from home? Um, so that's one of the things the Enneagram has really taught me is taking the taking my personality type in the sense of a mental health standpoint and the way I handle situations, when I start seeing myself gravitate to I'm working overtime to the max, I am loading up my schedule when I shouldn't have to too much. I am anxious about my work, my income, my well-being, about my family, and I'm not taking enough time to center in on myself yeah, I'm probably leaning towards a three. I'm in an unhealthy mental state. So going back to your original question, a sign, if you do read and go off of the Enneagram, take a look at what's your unhealthy side, what, which which arrow goes towards the unhealthy direction. What are the habits and tendencies of that number in a negative context? And if you start seeing yourself gravitate towards those, then yeah, you're, you're probably showing signs of... of the fact that you're not taking care of your mental state. Long. I have so much more about Enneagram. I have a whole PowerPoint. I'm not joking. I have a whole well, PowerPoint. That's why we keep saying we need to do a whole episode on it. I, th- I think that's a fantastic Maybe idea. June. We'll do it. I think that would be great. I think that'd be a great way to start yeah. off the June. Um, after next week. Maybe we do it yeah. after next the week. The June, not just June. The, the June. June. Not to be confused with a June, yeah. but the June. <laughs> um, the, the test is quite long. And if, if you know, real quick, I'm going to plug the Enneagram test that I take. Or I've taken. I've taken it twice. Um just because I wanted to make sure. Because some some tests are really are really shallow. You want to take the test if if you're going a free route. You want to take the test that has the most questions because um, you want to make sure you're really getting the best um, results because it's going to ask you basically the same question nine or ten times to see how you react to the way that question is formulated. And it bases your results off of how you respond and what selections you make based off of the wording of the question more so than what you respond. It's really kind of cool. Um, I would do the, uh, this one's, where's the one I usually do? This is it. I usually take the electric energies Enneagram test. Um, it's on electricenergies.com backslash Enneagram backslash test. It's free. Um, yeah. And if that's not one that you like, backdoor psychic thing. I'm sorry, (laughs) electric energy. Well, and if if that's not, you know, everyone should look up and maybe take it, take the test on more than one site just to see if the cohesiveness goes together. But you know, I can also on our on our episode, I can go through each enneagram in a short synopsis and what wings mean, what unhealthy and healthy means. You know, there's there's a lot, and that has 
going back to the main topic, that has really helped me center myself in stressful situations. I wish I had known about this back when I was in Houston for Hurricane Harvey. I think I would have handled that situation so much more healthily than I did then if I had known what my Enneagram tendencies were. So um, before we go on to our next two points, Liv, do we have any questions? Um, let me check real quick. Okay. Because, you know, homegirl's got to check. Okay. No, you're not allowed. John? <laughs> I almost sent you a text that had the had a had an emoji. <laughs> Use your imagination. Use your imagination. Um, currently we do not, but I'm going to keep keep an eye out on it. Okay. And while we are kind of pause between the between our topics i or we want to do a shout out to caroline because by the time this episode comes out it will have been her birthday what are we celebrating happy birthday (laughs) um so she didn't know we were gonna do this so um i just wanted to give a shout out or we wanted to give a shout out to caroline and say happy birthday to you Happy birthday. And then on the next one, it's going to be a shout out to Jordan. Woo-hoo! That's right. My birthday is coming up. So I'm excited. Me and Caroline, our parent, there was a great quote that I saw one time and I think it describes me and Caroline perfectly. And it said, the reason we are best friends is because God knew neither one of our parents could handle us being sisters. And I think all my, all my friends that I have, I think it defines that perfectly. Because God knew I couldn't handle having a sibling to begin with. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we just wanted to say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yay. Happy birthday. <laughs> Almost 30. <laughs> and then maybe I'll remember my age at one point. You're definitely going to remember your age after 30 because I'm throwing you a bomb 30th birthday. <laughs> All right. Um, so, going on to the to the next point. What... Uh, so we've kind of talked about like daily stuff and, and Liv, you talked about the Enneagram a little bit and kind of how you react to situations, but what happens when your mental health is not good consistently, but only at certain times. And we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what, what do you do when it's a consistent thing, but it's not all the time. So like we talked about with a mental illness, it's, you know, it springs up at random times. There's really no quote unquote consistency with it. What happens when it is consistently, there's, there's something besides just, you know, one day you're having a not good mental health day. Yeah. My first reaction to that particular question would be if it's, if you find yourself kind of in a constant loop of situational mental health being negative. There are a couple of things that I would suggest someone do. First, reach out to somebody you trust and be like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. This is kind of how I'm reacting to it. And it's been consistent for X amount of days and keep track of it. Um, But I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, And ask them, like ask them point blank, have you noticed a difference uh, in in the way I handle situations, the way I'm reacting or um, having a reaction to external stressors. Like, is there something different that you've noticed? Because one of the really crazy things is people that you're close to will pick up on it sometimes even faster than you can pick up on it. Mm-hmm. You know, just just throwing it out there. Um, Y'all know by the tone of my voice, and that annoys me sometimes to Liv, no end. Liv can pick it up by just looking yeah. at me a lot and of times. She knows if I'm not doing well. I can also tell through the way you text, <laughs> Jordan. That's that's wow. true. I do text differently. I, I hate to break it yes, to you. Yes, she does. Then, she, then she'll text differently Te- for no reason <laughs> and scare the crap out of me. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. Because she'll do things that she'll only do when she's upset. And then it's like, are you upset? She's like, no, I'm not upset. Why do you think that? Well, you're doing this. You do this when you're upset. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think everyone has has a tell when it comes to their mental health. And if something is becoming more consistent and is kind of snowballing into further and further depth 
um, whether it be, you know, negative or harmful. Um, and I think it's important to be able to reach out to somebody you trust, whether it be a parent, a colleague, a friend, a sibling, you know, just somebody you, you trust that will give you that full, blunt honesty, but know when it's the appropriate time. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because, like, Absolutely. I wouldn't just come out and say, hey, Jordan, you're acting different. Like, that would just <laughs> probably make it a lot worse. Oh, please. Oh, oh, you you want to hurt somebody who's hurting? Yeah, just straight up mm, do that to them. Yeah, like, why are you acting a certain? Wh- why are you annoying? Right. Why are you or why? You? Like, you're not a little kid. You're not. You don't have to be just like, you know, point blank shoot somebody between the eyes with that. Yeah, but like using terms like, "Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you holding up?" You know, little little things, little ways of starting a conversation with that individual to kind of not poke at it but open up the door and saying like hey I'm 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 genuinely asking you go ahead you can tell me like I'm I'm receive I want to receive what you're you're feeling I want to be here for you or I wouldn't be asking hey how you doing I just go straight into my own stuff you know what I mean yeah um I think another another thing that uh is is helpful is taking a journal log to to what you're feeling and how you're feeling. You know, it's never fun for people like me to journal. I hate journaling. I have always despised journaling. The only time I journal is if the Lord has called me to sit down and write. And he usually only does that for several, you know, several days to maybe two weeks at a time. He's like, I want you to spend X amount of time journaling and talking to me because he wants my full attention in that way, especially if I haven't been driving, because driving is my communication to God. And then on top of that, dancing is my communication forms to God. So if I haven't been doing those, like he's been calling me to journal recently. So I spend a couple of minutes every night just writing out how I'm feeling, you know, talking to God, being like, you know, I notice this, I notice this, or God, what's going on? Or just even like, today, this is what my day looked like. I ate Chipotle period. That's it. <laughs> but then, you know, all day, that's all I did. That's all I did. Ate Chipotle. Don't stop. From the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep. <laughs> I ate Chipotle. could. I love I Chipotle. bathed in cheese dip today. I would. I love Chipotle. I love Mexican food. I miss Tex-Mex and I mean true Tex-Mex. I just love it all. But yeah, I will then like go back and reread my journal entries when I feel like I'm running out of things to say or I'm getting more and more irritated with the fact that God has asked me to sit down and journal. And I look at how I'm wording things and I look at like, what am I constantly saying? And it's a really nice reflection of, oh, I'm neglecting my mental health right now. And that's why God's called me to do this is he wants me to recognize my mental health is kind of in an unstable situation right now. Now I'm fully aware and I can reach out to those people or I can do the self-help that I need to do or I can change up my everyday routine because right now we're in COVID, which is hard to change our everyday routine when our everyday routine is literally stay at home Yeah. or, you know, minimal, minimal contact with others. And that's fine, but maybe I need to change up what I do do at home. Maybe I need to change up what I, you know, sometimes it's even the route I take to get to my fiance's house. I'm like, I'm just going to change it up. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to go around this way opposed to this, this direct way that I usually go. Changing things up, making those subtle changes really will help. guys, Caroline here with a huge shout out to all first responders all over the world. Whether you're in a hospital or urgent care center or running deliveries for stores and restaurants, Call to the Table salutes your bravery and heroism in this crazy time of need. For those of us in different situations, let's continue to do our part by social distancing and sanitizing so we can beat this thing into the ground as one united force. That's all I've got for today. Bye guys! kind of went to like our last point without going to our last <laughs> <point>. <laughs>
<laughs> You're good at that, aren't we? Yeah. So I'm going to, because that was a long explanation, I'm going to reiterate the question to John. Sounds good. Yeah. Just So John. So John. <laughs> If you're, what if your mental health is not good, but only at certain times or certain situations? I mean, this is something that legit happened to me. This is part of the reason why I'm not the, my part-time job full-time anymore. (laughs) I started realizing that I was suffering from anxiety from it and only from it. Yep. I'd get home and I'd be thinking about it and yeah. Well, right. even well, even going to work, you were getting. Yeah, and even though it even still happens occasionally, even though I'm there only one to two days a week. Yep. So what did what did you do to handle that? I switched careers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. John has situational anxiety, and he's like, "I quit." <laughs> I mean, hey, sometimes. You really and truly do need to do that. I mean, I I did that for what was my part-time. I kind of wished it was full-time, but when I started my new job uh, in a school system, I quit my tutoring side gig because uh, I wanted to have time uh, where I didn't have to think, oh, maybe, you know, they're going to call me in or something like this. Because, no, I, I don't want to have to worry about stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I, I totally understand it. And that job also caused me some anxiety as well. Now, I will say, between John and I, his is much, much more stressful. Amen. But, you know, you, if, if really and truly, if you're in a bad place, you got to get out. Yeah. Like, I mean, I know, and that's a really hard thing to say, but your mental health is much more important than other things. and even though it feels like the way things are, there are no other jobs. I mean, all I can say is God will provide. He really and truly will provide. Um, I've seen this many times and sometimes it's just a leap of faith, but you're not doing yourself anything by being with the boss who is going to demean and belittle you and treat you like garbage and not give you the respect and protection that you need. I'm actually thinking about somebody specific who a family member is dealing with. But uh yeah, and that family member is leaving that place, by the way. Woo-hoo! So yeah. A little bit of context is mine. Caroline, it was years for me to actually make that move for those reasons of needed the money. And oh, I know. I took a pay cut when I switched. So I mean I, I know I'm, it was years. I'm letting you, you were I'm still, letting everyone well, else no. know. No, you were, no, I'm sorry. I know that. Sometimes it's like, (laughs) yeah, we're recording a conversation, but sometimes I'm like, oh, we're just having a conversation. Oh, wait. (laughs) And it took, yeah, it took, John came home. This was not a, he came home and was like, I'm getting anxiety. He came home and he was like, yeah, the weirdest thing happened to me today. And I said, what? He goes, well, when I was pulling into work, my chest felt tight and I was kind of short of breath. And I was like, no. (laughs) We're not having two people in this house with anxiety. Nope. And, not and happening. I think Liv has been waiting patiently with her hand. She right. has. Go ahead, Liv. Okay. So I'm going to put John in the hot seat, as I usually Woo-hoo! do, put people in a hot seat. So I've experienced situational anxiety in multiple different ways, being, you know, from. I I don't like using the term post traumatic stress because I think there's a lot of different ways to go about having stressors from past trauma being, you know, in a car accident and not wanting to drive, even though I was a passenger, uh, being a part of a toxic dance company and feeling abused. But let me, let me, so I, I know the, the stressors that lead us to quitting the job. And, you know, I've done that with a couple of my jobs, some that you guys know about and well, I've only done it with two. So one dance job and one dance company. And the restaurant I worked for, you know, it was not a good environment, but it wasn't the worst. And I just didn't, I didn't need the extra cash anymore. I was working full time and felt solidified, but I digress. What would, what advice would you give to somebody who may sit back and may be listening to this and like, oh my goodness, 
I feel that way right now about my job. How would you go about stepping away or quitting or leaving that job in a healthy way that keeps your mental state healthy moving forward, but also puts the ball in their court and you're not burning bridges? Oh, I can talk about the not burning bridges part, but does somebody else want to... Well, this is for John. Best say, what I've been doing... Oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got so caught up in the question. Thank you, Caroline. Love you, too. <laughs> but the job that I'm talking about, I'm able to go part-time to, and I've been doing a transition. It's been... Almost a full year since I went down to part-time at the job that I was talking about. So I'm still not completely out of there, although I am, you know, switching over to the other job. He's almost there. Almost. We're almost there. We got a couple more months. Yep. So. We're going to throw you a party. Happy he's finally out of redacted. <laughs> we going to be burning some uniforms. <laughs> I mean, melting. They're yeah. made of plastic, technically. <laughs> That's actually one of their big things. They make their uniforms out of Coke, recycled Coca-Cola bottles. Now we're, we can't get too specific here. Anyways, so, other than that, you know, for the years that I was trying to verbalize why I didn't want to be there anymore, it was just trying to find the bright things, trying to find value in the things that you are doing no matter what everybody else is saying trying to find people co-workers that you can communicate with and can share some of the pain with who understand where you're coming from because they're going through stuff too and that stuff helps prolong it to where you can possibly find another job and, of course, as always, the two weeks resignation, which this goes into the first job I had to quit because of the toxic work environment. But I, Oh, man, yeah. I love how I'm answering Liv's question and she's raising her hand again. You're, you're in the hot seat, which means I have all questions. I just want to make sure I get to them. <laughs> all questions, no answers. You must answer me. You just put, you know... You put the appropriate amount of time ahead of time of this is when I'm going to be quitting so that y'all can replace me, so that y'all can know, etc., etc. And you don't need to hang out the dirty laundry with your resignation letter. That's the big thing. Some people like hanging out their dirty laundry with their resignation letters, and that just gets ugly. That's why I'm going to have to write two for you, because there's going to be one that has all sorts of words in it that I can't actually submit. <laughs> From experience, don't write an ugly resignation letter. No, like a second one or like a first one? Like the original The only one. one. The only one. Just don't. Yeah, no. I'm, From I'm experience. seriously, I'm going to write a nasty one and then delete it and then just write the real one. And in my defense, I didn't, it wasn't ugly. It was truth speaking. And I should probably, I don't regret anything I said. I don't regret the way I put that resignation out there. I do not regret any part of it one bit. It did, however, the dance world is small. And it did, yeah. it, it did come back at me a little bit. But you know what? I've let it go. I don't really care anymore. <laughs> so what's your, what's your next question, Liv? So my next question is, and this, you know, this can go around the room um, as far as John doesn't have to be the only one in the hot seat, but I did want to ask John because you are in a current situation of transitioning from something that is affecting your mental health to leaving that job. Um, so that's why I wanted to direct the question to you in particular, but this can go around. What if your work environment is you know, relatively okay and not affecting your mental health, but the individuals you work with are contributing to a negative mental health work environment. What do you do then? That, that goes back to the job I had before the one I'm currently quitting. Yeah. And that, it took 
it took a long time for me to get to the point of just saying, okay, that's it. And I can't sit here and say a whole bunch of things on that because a year by a year by that point, I had somebody at the job I'm currently trying to quit trying to recruit me there. So that's, I have a bad, I'm not the best to answer this, but that's when I did also put a resignation letter out of saying, I feel like this is just where I need to go. I, I will answer kind of for you. Because there were, there were situations that came up where you had to, you didn't want to quit the job. It was one particular person. And it what it comes down to, and I've had to deal with this, of there being a particular person or individuals or whatever that are causing an unhealthy mental health, you know, situation. What I had to do is you have to sit there and either do some self-talk to you and kind of like to yourself and sit there and go, okay, it's, I've only got four hours left. I've only got three hours left and just kind of just pace yourself and grit your teeth and kind of just move through it. Or you have to go to the person or somebody over the person and just be like, I, I, I need some clarification. I need to know how to work with this person. Where the situation I'm at, it was somebody who was superior to me, who was over me that I, I really, really appreciate it and I liked talking to as an individual, but their working style clashed with my working style. And so I would get consistently frustrated because they just didn't have the same work style that I did. And what I had to do was go and find people who had similar frustrations and just vent. And that's that's all it came down to was just being able to get those emotions out without right you know writing a nasty resignation letter or whatever and just and John kind of had to do the same way where it was just being able to come home and call me and vent and just be able to get that anger out and to be validated that yes you have a reason to be upset but yes you still have a job to do um so yeah i i would say that find find somebody that you can vent to that you can get that validation from of of you are you are right to feel that way, but life must go on. <laughs> that would be the best thing I would say. I don't know if anybody else wants to add anything. Can I talk about burning bridges? Sure. Burn the bridges down. No. No. Do no. In this case. <laughs> no. Not He's at a all. witch. Burn um, her. <laughs> course, Monty Python. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, this was a case where I feel like I I had many reasons why it would have been okay for me to burn bridges with this person, um, because uh, just the the this was my like very first job out of uh college, and it was a restaurant, and uh that person, I I mean I know for a fact now that uh she underpaid me <laughs> for uh work. And I mean, she did that for everyone, but still, uh, just bad, not, not the best work environment. Um, she wouldn't listen to other people when they were telling her, no, we shouldn't be doing this. I had some of my worst work experiences ever at that restaurant. Cause sometimes, uh, she'd be like, oh yeah, we can handle a table of 27 people in a restaurant that could only comfortably seat maybe like maybe that many at you know separate tables with more than just two of us to wait on all of them including run the register as well as take the to-go orders and all of that jazz Yo, but those tips so, though those tips no with no 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 That's no 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 let me, no 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 you don't understand Liv. she she didn't have a gratuity that was tacked on already so they were free to leave whatever they left and some of them left nothing because the food came out at all different times and some of it got screwed up and whatever uh, because they all arrived at different times. And, you know, of course, we had to give them drinks and feed them. And some of those gave them uh, some of them gave us, if I can speak tonight, less than a dollar. And I, I wanted to cry like so hard. I mean, she she had things that other restaurants, you know, it's like, well, duh, we're supposed to do this No. No, she she wouldn't do it. And I know it was in the, you know, saving money for her. But, you know, it's like, please don't. Don't mess us up just because of your poor business habits. 
but I, this was God because I I probably would have burned a bridge with her at one point because there there were times when I genuinely was like, this is the worst night I have ever had to work anywhere because we were so understaffed. Some people would just, and when I say people, I mean uh, employees would just leave, just straight up leave out the door. But then again, one of them was also stealing from us. So, you know, having him gone was not a big deal, except it was one of the milk and bread runs at Kroger for everybody. And so it was literally just me and the boss doing everything with like one person cooking, which was an absolute nightmare. So, like I said, I had every reason to. But I was dear friends, still am dear friends, with a guy who works there who uh, happens to be her ex-husband. I know it's weird, but she she did him dirty. He, he is a wonderful, wonderful person. But anyway, uh, she has uh, two sons, one of whom is uh, in elementary school right now. And thanks to my intervening, because he was already at like a Christian pre-K that was very close to their house. I mean, less than five minutes away is also my church and my church's school. I was like, well, why don't you just put him there? You know, we have a really great church school. And I know for a fact that little, that little boy has had a huge impact on that family. I mean, they told a story in church about how he received, I don't know how he got the money. It may have been a, a pre- birthday present or whatever, but he had like $50. And he just went up to the principal and was like, here, I want to give this to the school. And they were so overwhelmed. They're like, well, what do we, what do we do with this kid's money? Where did he get the money? What, whatever. And because they were sort of trying to puzzle over what to do with it, he thought they were rejecting it. And he started to cry. And I was like, oh, my word. Oh, my word. I, this being in, you know, in a Christian environment has helped him so much, has helped his family. I am so glad I didn't burn those bridges because it it's a good reminder that God wants everyone to be saved. Just because someone is being a jerk to you, someone is absolutely blind to how they're treating other people and the messes that they put other people in doesn't mean that God says, okay, you can give up on this person, which is really hard to do when you're in the middle of all of that crap. But I am so thankful because of what has happened, you know, in the past that this is where we are now. And I have a good relationship with her. Sometimes she asks me to, I mean, she'll pay me, you know, it's like, hey, can you do some artwork for me on the outside of the restaurant? Can you uh, help me talk to this company about doing some designs that I want? And I do it. (laughs) She gives me free food. And I'm, I mean, that's a big bonus, but you know, it's like, yeah, she still she still has done a lot of questionable life choices, but I am very happy that oh. they are still in our lives because I, I'm just happy that I, I'm praying that that little boy has such an impact on that family. Because like I said, God wants everyone to be saved. It's really humbling to be able to see someone have that kind of turnaround because it makes you think, I can't just have this black and white mentality, even though I do feel like I've been hurt. I know I have been. I know I've been taken advantage of a lot. But God wants everyone, which means that sometimes you have to suck it up and go, I I shouldn't burn this bridge because who knows what will happen in the future. You know, maybe you'll have a positive impact on that person. And why burn a bridge? Because then... You know, that'll be their last Mm. memory of you. So imagine if God burned the bridge with Saul. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. See, see that that's exactly who I was thinking. I was thinking of Saul and uh, I cannot brain who was the first Christian martyr. Don't ask me. I can't brain. Um, um, I almost wanted to say Simon. I'm pretty sure that's wrong. No, hold on. Well, the well, the first Christian martyr. Hey, while you're looking it up, Liv. Oh, Stephen. Stephen. Okay, Stephen. Darn it! I just (laughs) pulled it up. Saul, Saul, and Stephen. They're gonna meet in heaven. Stephen has every right to hate him, but he's not gonna. 
he's going to embrace Saul like a brother and Saul is going to fall at his feet and go, I am so sorry. God did this for me. God did that for me. Uh, everything that Saul did in his life, he's not even going to be thinking about that. He's just going to be thinking about how he hurt that person and they're going to repair that relationship. Yep. So Liv, you had a question. Boom. Go. Yes. I'm, I'm going back to hot seat moment for a second. So Caroline, I completely agree with a lot of the things you said. I worked at a, re- a restaurant that I feel if I reported them to the Better Business Bureau, <laughs> something <laughs> would happen. But I do also see and feel like the Lord has, you know, without burning that bridge, the Lord has opened up an opportunity for, you know, worst case scenarios. I can go back. I, you know, they always said if I ever need a job, I have one. I've seen a lot of things that the Lord has done throughout that. I have a friend who is also in my bridal party that I've seen, you know, just through interactions with me is going back and questioning more positively about our faith. So I just want to, I wanted to say that and encourage you like, yeah, restaurant business is, is tough, but it's really cool to see that, see the Lord kind of work through that. My question is going back to, you know, coworkers, we talked a little bit more, we've talked about what if coworkers are bringing in an unhealthy mental state, but what if friendships are becoming a stressor on our mental health? What what if a friendship that we're trying so hard to maintain and work towards is actually contributing neg- negatively to our mental health? So is this for everybody or is this specifically for Caroline? This is for everybody. This this question is for everybody. And the follow-up so question is for everybody. I'm I'm going to take it here because we have had or I have had friends that have been in my life and very actively in my life and then there was a falling out and we did not talk. And I would say as somebody who has gone through that a couple of different times, the best thing, the best advice that I can give is if you have a friend that's being toxic, take some time away from them. And you don't even have to tell them. Just take some time away from them. Um, not meanly, I mean, but to, but to do some reflecting and see if it's something that you're doing or if it's something in particular that they're doing. And then if that time apart is really giving you like a sense of like, oh my goodness, I'm just happier in general with this, you know, without this person in my life, then when you are in a good state of mind, not when you're mad, um, make kind of almost like a script, but you don't have to stick with it, but just kind of make a point of some points of what you want to talk to the friend about of that are issues. Pray ahead of time before you do it. And then go to the person and say, I'm having problems with they're not problems, but I'm, this is becoming a problem in our friendship or this is concerning me or whatever. And if they don't respond well, if they get mad and they get, you know, accusatory in their language and stuff, then you just don't talk to them. And if they talk to you, if they're, if they try to reach out to you again, not being harsh, but just being honest and being like, I can't, I can't interact with you as long as you're doing X, Y, and Z. And it, I'm making it sound super easy. It sucks. Like it's not fun having to do that. Um, I was in a situation where a friend that I actually have reconnected with in the past couple of years, um, my goddaughter's mother, she, we had just a flat out falling out. There was kind of (laughs) one, there was kind of one big fight. And then we, we all kind of dispersed because John was in it as well. We all kind of dispersed and with the understanding of like we would come back and kind of talk once we were all kind of calm and that never happened. Um, And then I've also been in situations where I've had where I've had to sit down and. Well, it did happen. It did happen just years later. But I've I've also been in the situation where I've had to sit down and talk with the person and, and be like, this is a problem and this is a problem and what can we do to fix it? And it neither situation is fun to go through and it's upsetting and that's why I say pray heavily before you do it. Yeah. Uh, real quick, God is so cool because, you know, I asked this question and, you know, I felt like it was, God was laying it on my heart is in 
we edited, you know, we're going to edit out the details right. of why I felt like this question was on my heart. But Sam underscore Grace underscore zero zero actually responded. Uh, so shout out to her with the question of how to end a relationship with a toxic person. Oh. Uh, so God works so cool because, yeah. you know, again, I felt like this question was laying on my heart and I wanted to ask this with a couple of follow up questions. And, you know, God does that in our podcast so often is like, oh, we're on this track. And then he's like, hey, ask yeah. this question. I'm like, okay, God, sounds good. Um, so Sam underscore Grace underscore zero zero. Um, I want to give you a shout out real quick because we are talking about this question. And then I checked and you had asked this question. So, you know, shout out to you and shout out to God for laying it on my heart, but also yeah, laying it on sure. your heart. I don't know. That was my answer. I don't know if anybody else has anything to say. I mean, for me, it'd be coming from the perspective of a girlfriend. Because <laughs> you know a bit about this. The um, girlfriend I had before Jordan, she was very me-centered. As in, like, her... Self-centered. Self-centered. She was very self-centered. And very manipulating and had a family that was very manipulating also. And not not like her extended family, but, like, just her mom and siblings. And very vindictive. Yes. And the time... I took away going on a family vacation. Really, I mean, I talked to her several times about changing stuff to where you know to help the relationship. I already saw the writing on the wall and try to you know fix the relationship also. And it took that time being away from everything for two weeks, just about. Yeah. And it was like, okay, yeah, I just can't keep going, and I just had to end it immediately when I thought it. And I know it's not the best way to end a relationship as over text message, but that's how I end up having to do it. But sometimes, I mean, you need to do that because you know if you get on the phone and you start trying to talk to the person, you're going to start yelling. Well, actually, it started off as a phone call. Okay. And it ended up with her not being able to hear me over her crying. See, or that. But... I don't like remembering details from that girlfriend. Yeah, well. <laughs> I was in a different time zone at the t- current period of time. Yeah, so. whatever. <laughs> whatever. Caroline, do you have anything else to add? I was that toxic friend once. And it's hard being told by somebody that you care about that you're... I'm not going to say that you're not good for them, but that, you know, what you're doing is hurting someone else. And for me, a perfectionist, a people pleaser, that was incredibly hard because it was very easy for me because it's very easy for me to see things in black and white. I saw myself as an unredeemable bad guy at that point and it just made everything worse because that's not what my friend was telling me. Now, we did not have a falling out at all. We have stayed friends. I wish we lived closer, but she lives all the way in Wisconsin. And (sighs) can't do nothing about that. But uh, anyway, and I I only get to see her on occasion. But we're still friends. And I mean, we we both... (sighs) I'll tell you, part of it was the fact that we both were introverts who were trying to uh, like make each other our sort of only friend for everything. And I was the one who took it too far and tried to treat her like she could handle literally everything when she couldn't. And I was toxic for her in that way. It was not good. I was also not a good roommate to the other two people that I lived with my senior year because I didn't know how to live with that many other people in a house that was not my own. And uh, I'm not saying I was like a terrible person or anything. Like I wasn't having screaming matches or whatever, but you know, being inconsiderate about cleaning up some things or uh, just the way things were. It's, you know, my mental health was not good in college at all. And learning that you can mm-hmm. come out of a toxic state, it's it's very good. You are not yeah. the bad guy. You just have to figure out you can come out of it. it. It doesn't mean you're an unredeemable villain, no matter what TV tells you. You are not an unredeemable villain that the heroes now get to destroy. You have made a bad choice, whether because it was something that was taught to you 
or, you know, you purposefully did it, uh, this is still something that you can take back. I mean, granted, and I know we always bring this up, you can't take back a murder, but, you know, toxic friendship. I'm like offended I said. that you would murder somebody. The fact that you decided to take <laughs> someone's life. Yeah. Hey, and I always have to bring it up. That that's that's one of our <laughs> one of our new inside jokes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so offended that it keeps getting <laughs> Well, Olivia, I'm offended that you're offended by that. You know what? Offense is subjective. So if you're offended by my actions of being offended, that's on you. <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face and you're not even sitting next to me. <laughs> ah. So yeah, that that was basically mine. You can be on the other end of the spectrum and you can come out of it. And sometimes it takes, you know, work together. Sometimes you have to give the other person space and, you know, go, hey, I want to fix this. But if they need time, you know, to build the trust back up, give them time. Because if you value your, your relationship with that person enough, you're going to make the effort, particularly because you want to be a different person. Yeah. Well, this is your opportunity. So, yeah. So, that's, Liv, what was- that's my input on it. I, I feel know. like this has turned into something completely different. I know this is about mental health, but we it's kind okay. of wandered. Well, if you don't mind me bringing it, it back a little bit, um, when it comes to toxic relationships or friendships, um, it really can p- take a, a toll on your mental health because whether they're aware of it or not, whether they're aware of their them being toxic, whether they're aware of what their actions are, uh, you know, how they're affecting you or not, it is really taking a toll and grooming the mental state of the person that they are friends with and with that connection with. Being on the receiving end of, of toxic relationships, being, you know, I don't want to use the term romantic relationships, but more on the spectrum of romantic relationships or friendship relationships, because they're both relationships. You know, I can call, I can say to my friend, hey, I'm, you know, our relationship is dope. It doesn't mean we're a romantic one. So I want to specify whether it be one or the other. If you're allowing that to take a toll on your mental health and you're allowing that, you know, like we talked about early, earlier, that snowball effect of, of having that inconsistent, consistent mental health downward spiral, it, it, it's grooming you to be okay with that. And that's not okay. It's not okay to sit back and say, oh, I'm okay with being anxious because this person is giving me the friendship that I, I want, I'm wanting from them, even though I'm anxious all the time, or even though I'm depressed, or even though they're talking down to me and I feel belittled and I feel lesser than, these are all things that are affecting your emotional, mental, and spiritual state. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, phys- mm. you know, you can even go down to the physical state of, oh, this person, I consider them such a, you know, high person on my on my friends list or a high person in my my life. They don't like this. I'm not going to eat that around them because they've made it known that they're, you know, hurt by that or whatever. You know that they don't like it. So you've changed your eating habits. These are all things that affect your mental health. You know, whether you're on the receiving end or you're on the, you know, giving end of of being you know in the in the toxic friendship or toxic relationship and i think it's important to know that yes while i agree with all three of you you know taking that time taking that breather it's also okay to cut them oh out. yeah absolutely i wasn't that's what i was saying is oh no i mean i'm glad you included that we just didn't yeah we didn't get to that part but yes yes yeah yeah that's why i, I was willing to bring it up well that's kind of what i did do with my example right i think i'm looking at it more in a friendship perspective because one of the things that i think we're constantly fearful of is what if i do end that friendship you know what if i do indirectly burn that bridge you know it's again it goes back to like what we were talking about with work it can it can have two outcomes it can have a positive outcome or a negative outcome you know you never really know and you know, no one seeks out the opportunity to burn a bridge with somebody that they're friends with. 
but it can be received that way from the other party if they're if they're in an unhealthy mental state. You know, we all we always have to take into consideration that someone's perspective and someone's reality can be different in the same conversation, I- just like we talked about, you know? And whether or not, you know, that person receives it well or not, taking the time to really pray about, is this really smart for me? Is this really good for me to take this person and remove them from the equation? And if God's like, yeah, you know, it's okay to do that. And yeah. it's okay to, to, to grieve in that. But it's also better for your mental health if that person is negatively influencing your mental state of being. I will also add to that, Liv, of going back to my example of my my goddaughter's mother. When me and her and John, all three, the three of us were kind of hanging out together at the time. And of course, me and John kind of cut, not cut her off, but we we all just kind of stopped being friends and whatever. I will say this. There were years where had anybody asked me, I would have been like, yeah, I'm totally fine if she never comes back in my life. Like, I'm done with her. This is whatever. It was a couple years ago. I was, it was randomly one night. She got laid on my heart and I went and talked to John and I said, I really feel like I'm being called to to talk to her. Like, I feel like I am being asked to go and apologize for my side of it because at the end of the day, a relationship does take two people. And yes, a person can be toxic. I'm not at all saying that it's on both sides, but when you have a falling out, there are two sides to it. And I felt like I was being told to go to her and to apologize for my side of things. And so I did. And we are two years later of she now has a daughter we are the godparents we have a great relationship I see her frequently our relationship is a whole lot better than it was back in college and if I had sat there and continued to have a hard heart about her due to past pain I would not have my goddaughter now and I would not give her up for anything so I will say to anybody who is ending a relationship Absolutely. If a person is toxic, you can't, you can't have them in your life anymore. Absolutely end it. Pray, continue to work on yourself as well. And if you ever do get that nudge that you need to talk to that person or you need to reconnect with that person, don't fight it due to past pain. There may be a reason the person may have changed drastically and you may have changed drastically to where you guys now can have a relationship again that's so much better and so much more mature than it was prior and that's that's where I have a relationship now with my goddaughter's mom is we're we're great friends and like I said I have my goddaughter now and I would not have had that had I stayed hard-hearted yeah and that transitions me into my second part of you know not just Sam's question but you know my original question you know say you've recovered from that mental health block, that 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 unhealthy state, and God's laying it on your heart to reach out to the to that individual. What would you suggest be the best best method, and what would you suggest be the best way to protect your mental health if a relationship were to build back up in that sense? And then, you know, on the flip side, what if they don't respond? How do you handle and work on your mental health with the with the fact of rejection built upon that? For bringing somebody back in, if God is laying it on your heart, for me it was easy because there had been such a big falling out and so I knew that going to going to her and saying I apologize for my part and I hope you're doing okay and you know, that, that was the easiest way for me. And if that, that may be what God leads you to do. That was what I was being led to do is to apologize for the, for my side of stuff. If it's not a situation like that, where it's somebody who just was, you know, toxic, or you don't feel like you're being asked to apologize or whatever, 
just go and I I've had people who have who have I ugh, who I have reconnected with due to the podcast. I've had to message them and say, "Hey, I need permission to talk about this story that happened between you and me, and I just want to make sure it's okay with you because if you ever hear it, I don't want you getting mad at me." And now I've I have relationships that I've reconnected with because of that. So I think if you're being asked to, if God is leading you to reconnect with somebody, if you are praying and you're being earnest in that, I think God will lead you to what you're supposed to say. And then if the person doesn't respond, that's not anything you can control. You got to do what God's asking you to do. And that's it. If that it's up to God to work on the other person's heart, that's not anything you can control. And that's something that is, again, it sucks, but you need to, you need to go into it knowing you may not get the response that you want. Because I believe a big part of it is forgiveness. Absolutely. And you don't mm -hmm. forgive somebody for their sake. You yep. forgive somebody because of what that does on your heart. Yep. Mercy, yes. And who that can turn you into. Because, I mean, if you go and you sit there and go, hey, I'm sorry for my part of this, or hey, I want to try again with our friendship that is you sitting there and putting your heart on the line and that's again a you thing you almost have to pre-forgive yeah and <laughs> you know the story of a man god telling a man to go out and push a boulder comes to mind where god you know a guy gets told by god to go out and push a boulder. And he does this every single day, rain or shine, snow or sleet, for years. And he eventually just goes, God, I can't move this boulder. Why am I pushing this boulder? And it's because you have gotten stronger. Take a look at yourself. Yeah. You have developed muscles. You have developed persistence. You have developed determination and willpower. It wasn't to move the boulder. It yeah. was to improve you. Yeah, I agree. And Caroline, you and I on a less uh, drastic level have kind of had to go through this with our friendship where we both have said stuff to each other that has been hurtful or that has been um, negative. And you and I have had to kind of sit there and process stuff on our own and forgive each other on our own before we but that, go. That's kind of like friendship regular stuff, though. Okay, who took their earphones out? Do what? I'm suddenly hearing myself played back. Oh, uh, I don't know. Nothing's changed. Huh. I don't like that. Uh, But I, I felt like that was just more, I don't know, regular stuff? I mean, that's why I said on, an, on a less drastic level. We have, going off of what John said with the forgiveness, we have had to sit there and end it like forgive each other away from each other before we go and talk about it together. I don't know if this answered Liv's question. I mean, yeah, it does. I mean, I think forgiveness is a huge... I'm hearing myself. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, I think forgiveness is a huge aspect of recovering and mental health. I'm going to just insert really quick. Uh, I think if you feel like the Lord is calling you to reach out to that person that has damaged your mental well-being and damaged you in some way that has caused you in a in a negative way to have mental health issues, um, to go in with a softened heart but a strong mind. Yeah. Make sure that you are in a position mentally where you are willing to combat any attack of the enemy or any re reoccurring habits that might that person might still have because everyone's growth is different and everyone's development is different and if that person while God has asked you to reach out that person may have not changed very much and that maybe they haven't re you know really rediscovered themselves and kind of redefined their their mental mental state and their heart you have to be prepared 
for any attack that you might receive and you might have to be prepared for any reoccurring habits that might happen, you know, and if that's the case, you need a strong mind, but also having a softened heart, which forgiveness kind of falls into, you know, and um, in my experience, you know, with friendships falling out, um, I've learned that you know, college friends that I've had falling outs with that I've rediscovered and redefined friendships with, I've had a stronger mind and a softened heart because, you know, maybe they didn't know what they were doing. Maybe they just needed that attention and maybe they needed that focal point. Um, But also maybe God's just trying to soften your heart. You know, maybe he's asking you, hey, I want you to reach out to this person or, hey, I want you to just pray for this person. And that's something that I've discovered recently is I've had reoccurring dreams and I've had to evaluate them and be like, God, what are you asking of me? And all he said was, I want you to pray and have a softened heart because you never know what that person's going through in that moment. That's all. (laughs) I got you. So real quick before we we let John do his radio voice. I'm not doing my radio (laughs) voice. Just real quick, go around the circle and just say, um, what are some suggestions that you have for people to improve their daily, just day-to-day mental health to keep it positive consistently? Obviously, there are factors that can affect that, but um, especially now during COVID, what what would you uh, suggest? Go, Liv, go. Pray, give yourself grace, and talk to somebody. (laughs) Liv and I have had to do that with each other. <laughs> it's been great. JG, what about you? I would add sleep to that. <laughs> but not but not too much sleep. Not too much, but add enough, you know, enough sleep. Not all of us can still get enough sleep, but that's, you know. You know, some of us don't have the opportunity to stay up till <laughs> three and wake up at ten. Yeah, some of us have to, you know, be waking up at like three. <laughs> I would say get sunlight at some point in your day. Go Amen. Out, go out and get sunlight because it majorly, majorly affects your mood. That's what I would say. No, I'm a vampire. <laughs> Caroline, what about you? I mean, talking to somebody else for uh, their perspective and, and going to them and going, is this normal? I mean, it's it's so helpful because if you stay inside your whole own head for so long, you won't realize exactly what, you know, normal is, you know, unless you've bounced it off, not just one person, but maybe several people, several people that you trust. Um, And again, giving, gra- I mean, I, f- I feel like you guys already, <laughs> you already took all the good answers, <laughs> but that's essentially, I mean, that's essentially it, you know, get out of your own head. That's mine. There we go. Because, you know, sometimes I your mean, head can be the worst prison you'll ever be in. Also, changing your routine is great. Or even better yet, changing your weekly, like, food. I found that I, if I experiment with one new recipe a week, I feel totally different. That's a good idea. Less mundane. Gotcha. Yeah, or get yeah, because I can eat the same food every single day. Like I can eat Chipotle, Chick Fil A, uh, anything that's chicken related, spaghetti all the time. I'm Italian; it's okay. <laughs> I I but I I tried a new recipe, a new baking way of like making a cake for Mother's Day, and it was so much fun to experiment with something different. It was so fun. I would also say if you are able to get yourself just a little something special, I got out of the house today and got myself watermelon. I am so excited. I have a watermelon and it actually was a good one. So it, it it's a nice little boost. I came home and like ate almost a half of one. And it's still taking up a lot of our yes. refrigerator. Shush. Nice. Or play Animal Crossing. Play Animal Crossing. It no. Will Not everyone can live. <laughs> I love Animal Crossing, and if you love it too, send me your friend code. <laughs> I have all the fruit. Oh goodness! All right, John. <laughs> Liv, oh, Liv, do you want to plug our um Twitter? Because I don't think John knows our. No, Twitter. I do not have that memorized. Yeah, that's okay. I will plug our Twitter, uh, guys. If you are interested in seeing some fun nerdy 
responses and some fun retweets of nerdy stuff and you just want to see a nerdy side of calls to the table head to our twitter because i run that (laughs) which means it's all nerd stuff right now um i also do some faith stuff i do some bible verses and whatnot i'm trying to find some good ones to plug in um but you can follow us on twitter at called to the wow call to the cable really (laughs) Really? Yes, Olivia? Yes, Learn how to we are on okay. cable network now. We are. All on cable now. Age, called to the cable. I was called to the cable because I didn't have cable until I was eight. See, so I, I went from cable. antenna to dish. <laughs> okay. I don't remember. We watched Survivor and Big Brother. It's okay. Uh, but you can find us at Call to the Table. That's our name. But if you look for our at, it's at Table Team C T T T, which I might be changing soon. Again? Again. Well, okay. Let I'm going to take a poll. How would we? How do we feel about table team C3T? Ooh, I like that. See, that's what I'm going to change it to. So instead, when you listen to this, it will now be at table team C3T. That's there our Twitter. Yeah. Twitter is fun. <laughs> I'm obsessed right now. <laughs> John says it sounds Star Warsy. Well, right now we have a lot of Star Wars fans. <laughs> and you'll understand why next week I'm taking John's role. Next week when we do a fun crossover event. Woo-hoo! I'm so excited. All right, John, lead us out. Thank you for listening to this episode of Call to the Table. <laughs> Just, you know, pointing table out a little bit. Back on. <laughs> Not pointed out that hard. <laughs> Dot com. Feel free to message us about future episode suggestions and questions, comments, concerns, especially about oh, you took my health. <laughs> at either our Facebook and Instagram at Call to the Table Pod or at Call to the Table at Gmail. Dot com. <laughs> dot org dot usa dot gov <laughs> backslash olivia rocks <laughs> backslash no comment alrighty then <laughs> we'll see you next time y'all bye. bye and look next week's gonna be so exciting I know you wanna listen in <laughs>